Okay, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to today's IIED debates event, which is looking at what justice um, means for the energy transition and how we achieve it. So today's event is part of the IIED debates series, um, and we're really delighted to be hosting this in partnership with Access and Loughborough University. We've got a really fantastic session lined up um, and some really fantastic speakers. So before we kick off and meet them all, I'm going to run through some housekeeping. I am really delighted to hand over to Ben Garside, a principal researcher at IAD. Um, he leads our work on energy access and renewable energy and is going to be our moderator for today's event. So Ben, over to you, please. Thanks very much, Juliet. Uh, good afternoon and good evening to those joining across Africa and Asia, and uh, good morning to you joining from Europe. And if you're joining from the Americas, a very good morning. Um, I'm Ben Garside. I'm a principal researcher and lead the energy team at IID. Um, just to introduce our energy work a little bit, our framing for energy is that it is a key enabler for the types of marginalized communities IID works with, with potential to deliver impacts across sectors and transforming lives and livelihoods. But these impacts are often not realized just by providing the access to energy. Beyond the connection this itself, there are compounding barriers which prevent access to and affordability of, of outcomes such as reliable equipment use, creation of new local businesses for improved income, value added for small farmers, and sustainability of services such as health and clean water that use energy. Energy services can also be part of strategies for building community resilience to climate change. But again, this is not automatic. So working with partners, we develop and learn from scalable approaches that design and deliver holistic energy enabled solutions, starting with uh, an impacts focus. The resulting solutions are tailored to local priority, priority development needs including those that I mentioned on livelihoods, health and water, and the contextual factors that can really make or break uptake and sustainability of the solutions. As Juliet mentioned, this webinar is co-hosted with our partners, Loughborough University's Centre for Sustainable Transitions, Energy, Environment and Resilience, or the STEER Centre, as well as the Alliance for CSOs for Clean Energy Access, uh, known as ACCESS. So on to the main subject of today, what does, just trans what, do, what does justice mean for energy transitions and how do we achieve it? Uh, just energy transition partnerships or the JETPs are a high visibility, big budget instrument being discussed at the upcoming, uh, upcoming climate summit, COP28. Uh, the first of these, the South Africa JETP was launched at COP26 with the first phase promising eight and a half billion USDs to replace South Africa's aging coal powered electricity with renewables and supporting programs or justice for those negatively impacted in coal mining and coal power station jobs. South Africa uh, came back in COP27 with a just energy transition investment plan, a JET IP, which came in significantly higher, 1.5 trillion rand or 82 and a half uh, billion USD to be spent over the next five years alone. More jet peas have subsequently been announced, including 20 billion USD for Indonesia, 15.5 from Vietnam, and 2.5 uh, million, uh, 2.5 billion for S Senegal with other countries such as Nigeria and India also being discussed. So the aims of the workshop here and the webinar that we're having, first of all, we're gonna be talking about scope. Um, we have panelists coming from uh, multiple uh, countries and backgrounds who I'll introduce uh, in a minute. Um, the scope increased understanding of what a just energy transition could really mean beyond reducing emissions and net zero targets, um, using our country context examples and bringing in a, a range of perspectives. We'll explore what scope the JETPs themselves could or should have, and more broadly, 
outside of the jet piece what a just energy transition concept can usefully uh, uh, have for increasing the uh, equity and justice, considering the energy sector itself and jobs in it, and more widely, how energy could be used as part of moving to low carbon, uh, uh, energy use itself as part of moving to low carbon economies. Secondly, we'll look at implementation pathways. We have a little bit on the scope, what people think that the, the definition should be. The implementation pathways will look at uh, how, uh, how we do it, increased awareness of the types of approaches to operationalize a just energy transition from the jet peas down to national level and community level processes that can really fundamentally drive uh, the social acceptance of the transition, again, within the energy sector itself and beyond this. Lastly, we'll look at the policy and finance. So the JetP big numbers have a big focus on commercial loans. That's potentially limiting what can be funded from a justice perspective at national level and the responses at the national level that are being developed. We'll be discussing what policy measures and the types of finance that are needed to maximize the impacts of a just energy transition. IID's own interest, this webinar is a deep dive into the energy, a deeper dive into the energy sector as part of a reflection on a broader conceptualization of justice in the transition towards a fairer low carbon society. And we've run already a, a webinar that had a very strong gender focus in just transitions uh, that I encourage you to look back on if you're interested. Um, today, I would like to retain the focus on what marginalized groups, uh, uh, how which marginalized groups are impacted and how um, by a, a, an energy transition and how can they be empowered to be part of a change agenda. So coming on to our speakers, first of all, we have Tando uh, Lukuko, who is a coordinator for the Climate Action Network in South Africa. Uh, we have Dr. Malestia Chitraningram, known to her colleagues and friends as Chitra, and she is the Sustainable Energy Access Program Manager for the Institute for Essential Services Reform uh, in Indonesia. We have An Adenike Ambibola, and she's a Senior Assistant Research and Data uh, Analyst at the, Ni the Nigeria Energy Transition Office of the Sustainable Energy for All Initiative. Emmanuel Sioy is, is a sustainable energy and climate resilience expert and the energy delivery models lead in Kenya. And lastly, we have uh, Somkele Awakulu, so, excuse me, Awakalu, who is a finance specialist also working at Sustainable Energy for All in Nigeria. So let me come on to our first question around scope. Uh, Tando, the South Africa uh, JetP is focused on justice for those working in the energy sector being displaced from coal jobs. Can you tell us a bit more about what debate is happening in South Africa on this scope? Um, thanks, Ben. Um, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to everyone on the call. Um, I think for my own clarity, I I'd like to quickly just provide two definitions for, or at least one for justice and one for equity, which helps me frame my intervention. So for justice, we define it, or at least I define it as giving people what's rightfully theirs. And we equate equity simply as fairness, right? Um, just, just to be on the same level with, um, for all of us. Now, the focus on the energy component, particularly, and the jobs component, number one, is critical because <clears throat> The biggest exposure at the moment in our country to climate impacts outside of communities and families and households from an industry perspective is the coal sector, right? We've got, uh, it's about 80% of our electricity comes from coal. The transition away from coal is gonna most impact those individuals and our economy is largely driven by coal as well. So it's necessary first and foremost to understand that if we're gonna be transitioning, how do we ensure that the transition happens but in so doing, that we do not lose the gains that we have as a country, we don't lose the advantages that we have as a country and the economy. We've got economic sectors that um, 
of bringing in um, significant, um, I guess, revenue for, for, for the state. And so ensuring that we don't lose that is necessary for the country's well-being and also for the citizenry. Now, the challenge with this jobs perspective is where then will those who have been displaced from coal jobs move to? And this is probably the single hardest question that we've had to answer because if, if anyone has been on a renewable energy plant, for instance, you'll know that the, the number of heads working in that particular facility compared to a traditional coal-fired power station is a fraction, right? So I've been on one where we had the entire 14 staff running, I think a 96 megawatt facility, whereas a coal facility is using um, something like 1,300 jobs to go take, just an arbitrary number. So it's necessary then to figure out where are those people going to go once we displace them from the coal jobs. And the justice component then is to say, it wouldn't be fair to say, you've been working in this particular space for a long time, and now that you're shifting, there's no plan for you any longer. So there needs to be some kind of conversation around where that plan is going to come from. And this is where the current debate is, is, is in South Africa, is that on, particularly on the jobs component, where are the actual numbers coming from for the absorption of that labor force? This is looking at both the, let's call it the new labor force, so young entrants into the market, but also then those who are too old to be able to shift away um, into new um, into new spaces. So what kind of plans exist? So the debates are, how can we ensure that the jobs for those who are, are fit to be able to take on these new uh, renewable energy jobs, for instance, that there's um, skilling that's there, that there's um, support for them that's there, and reskilling for those who then won't um, make it into this new dispensation, if you will. Now, there's also a question um, about just the allocation, and uh, and maybe this might be for, for a later debate, but the, the allocation of energy that is relative to how much electricity people are using at home, vis-a-vis -vis how much um, is necessary for an equity, um, from an equity perspective. <clears throat> the current numbers are saying that the state is already providing 50 kilowatt hours of electricity for free, right, well, for free. That number is insufficient for any particular household to be able to survive. And the current argument is that that number needs to increase from 50 kilowatt hours to 350 kilowatt hours. This will provide for sufficient electricity for people to then power their homes, continue to make uh, a living some kind of way. They would be able to um, develop and self-actualize at some point. It might not be a great deal, but it would provide that space. The debate is where that financing will come from and whether or not there's scope for that, particularly in, in the current uh, policy framework. And there's a free basic alternative energy uh, policy which exists that speaks to how this could be fed through renewable energy, particularly this additional component. There's one last thing that I'd like to touch on, and that's a bit of a debate that, that kind of transcends this one on the jobs alone. And that is to say that the just transition also needs to look at a just transition of spaces like agriculture, a just transition of space like um, food and so on, so that we get to better understand that when we're talking about a just transition, we're talking about a, a, a change in the system itself. When you're talking about a just energy transition, we're talking about the change in the energy system. But now all these other systems also require change, but the challenge is we don't yet have a full grasp of what exactly the, the, the end state will be of the energy transition specifically. And it's the single most important one because it's the one that powers the economy. So at the current moment is to say, Yes, these conversations are necessary, that these debates are necessary, but we first have to get a firm grasp of what does it mean on the energy spectrum and how it impacts the economy before then we open up the box to say, how does it then impact all these other spaces? Even though we understand that the nature of climate change, the nature of just transition is a transversal one, right? It doesn't pick one and it doesn't follow a linear process. So, so the scope in, in, in South Africa has, has taken really those three dimensions. Should we increase it beyond just the jobs conversation? Should we increase it beyond just the energy conversation? And should we increase it beyond just an access and an equity perspective, just in terms of how much energy people will get in this new dispensation of the energy system? Thanks, Ben. Thank you very much, Tanda. Very interesting. Um, Chitra, let me come to you. I know the Indonesian government have been running consultations on what the JetP should be looking like in Indonesia and, and the ISR have been part of that, um, what what should be specifically included in the jet piece and, and what else is needed as part of a, a just energy transition? 
All right, thanks, Ben. And also thank you, Thando, for providing a lot of context on how just the just principle ma manifests in the so basically our government has just finished uh, the comprehensive investment and policy plan for the JEPI. It has been released to the public and they hope to get um, inputs for it until November 14, which is early this week. Um, and it has been quite a, a lot of chatter about how the plan should be uh, manifested because first, Justice means inclusivity, of course, and the public consultation that has been held prior to the release of the plan is was very limited. So there has been um, criticism on how a lot of group, groups should be included in the development of the plan itself um, and how the uh, principle should be uh, defined in the document. Um, however, I would like to definition of just transition and I'm going to read it um, verbatim. So in the documents for JP Indonesia, um, the just transition is defined as an energy transition in which the resulting social, economic, and environmental risks and opportunities are equitably distributed among stakeholders according to their capacity and condition affirmatively enable for number stakeholders to mitigate the risks and and capture benefits um, from operation of justice and the framework that comes with the plan. It has um, nine principles that should guide um, on how the plan manifested in projects and implementation. However, it is um, quite disappointing that the detailed uh, plan and approach on how to do just transition, especially regarding works, uh, workers, um, coal jobs, it, uh, you mentioned, and also um, energy access are quite limited in the plan. So from our um, perspective, it is necessary not only to mention the principle and the safeguards uh, regarding the just transition, but how the actual plan for renewable energy power plants transitioning from coal or critical minerals jobs that are very important in the transition could also give positive impacts uh, of the economy to different um, groups and also different areas in Indonesia. And I guess one of the limitation of the plan is also, it still very focuses on coal, but does not consider um, other um, and also how to provide a lot of energy access to those who does not have it for now, because then we can always say, yes, you can transition from fossil energy to renewable energy. But what about people who does not really have access? What, what do they transition for? Fantastic. So the plan doesn't have so much on energy access in there and doesn't disaggregate the groups that would be receiving that so much, but you think it should. Is that, is, that, is that a correct summary? Right. The energy access part is mainly missing. There, there are a lot of renewable projects, but it's quite high, not community, um, the big scale, not community-based renewable energy. Um, also, uh, the budget for the just, just transition principle is less than 1% of the 20 billion US dollar. Thank you. It's very clear. Uh, Somkeli, I'm going to come to you. Uh, Nigeria is, of course, a big... Uh, oil and gas producer and has a heavy use of diesel for localized power generation. What's being discussed and what should be in scope on the jet peas? Um, and what 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 sorts of other processes are also needed as a complementary? Thank you very much, Ben. Um, uh, apologies if I go in and out. Um, I think I've been having some problems with my, my internet. So thank you very much, uh, Chitra and Tando, uh, for the context you provided uh, from, from your own countries and, and the fact that jet peas have been announced in those countries. Uh, so the, the difference here with our, with our Nigerian context is that uh, we're focusing on a theory of change around diesel displacement. We don't have a coal problem. Um, I think the, the coal bit of our history is long gone so a lot of what we're trying to do now is displace diesel and petrol gensets in the household 
as well as in industries and commercial commercial areas. Um, I'll just take it back a bit and, and try to build up on what uh, the basis of our energy transition is. And that's a federal government approved energy transition plan that charts five pathways to getting to net zero by 2060. So that's around power, that's around buildings, that's around transport, um, clean cooking and industry. So our thesis when we're thinking about accessing the funding for JetPs is around diesel displacement, improved sources of cooking, so clean cooking solutions, as well as uh, e-mobility and the transition to um, electric mobility. You also have to think about it that Nigeria has 200 plus million people and about 250 plus different tribes. And the gender split is more or less 50-50. So when you're thinking about justice in the Nigerian context, all those different um, statistics have to be considered. So when you look at an, an area like clean cooking, for instance, that is disproportionately affecting women because it's the women that go to get, uh, that use the biomass, that use the animal dung, that use the firewood, and that affects their ability to have economic opportunities. So when you're crafting the justice element and trying to think about your energy transition, you have to factor in the Nigerian context, perhaps elsewhere, there's a, a balance on the cooking and the men cook and women cook, but pro disproportionately in Nigeria, there's a, a gender bias for women on the clean cooking side. So what we're essentially trying to do is we're trying to get the data from a bottom up approach to understand the specific geographical needs of the Nigerian people, because in Northern parts of, of the country, their usage of, of, of their diesel and gensets will differ from the southern part of Nigeria. Same thing with the clean cooking, same thing with the e-mobility. So in the Nigeria context, I believe that first of all, the scope of the jet peas has to be moved beyond just coal-based economies because at an estimate, we're looking at 45 gigawatts of power being generated by diesel and petrol gensets. If we're able to displace that, that's a significant reduction in carbon emissions. And so for me, I think that the scope needs to be widened as well as understanding the various Nigeria contexts that tie into the justice element. Thank you very much, Sankirli. Um, and please, uh, participants, please uh, add your questions as we're going to the chat. Uh, the chat, I believe, is open to, to be adding questions. Uh, Emmanuel, let me come to you. Uh, the Kenyan context is really quite different. The grid is largely powered by renewable energy. Is there a space for uh, jet P uh, type processes in in Kenya? Yeah, thank you, Ben. And um, you're right that Kenya uh, grid is more or less more renewable, but if you if you reflect back, um, fossil fuel is not only used in electricity generation, but it's also applicable across other sectors of the Kenyan economy. So just to give an example, there's the transport sector, which rely heavily on fossil fuel based um, services. Um, so in looking at the scope of JP, perhaps it should be made context specific and also look at what is actually the heavy emitters in a given country. Beyond fossil fuel, there is also the heavy reliance on biomass fuels in cooking, which are also emitters. But again, Kenya, where it sits, it, it's in a position where it can easily fall back to use of fossil fuel in electricity generation. There is a disconnect between what is stated in the policy and what is stated in the country's NDCs. Uh, just to demonstrate, <clears throat> in the northern of the country, there is, a, there is an ongoing exploration of oil, um, which has great potential of greenhouse gas emission. 
And secondly, there has been ongoing debate on putting up a, a coal fired fire, fire power plant in the coastal Kenya. And actually that coal fired plant has a potential of releasing 8.8 .8 million tons annually if it's put into, into use. So perhaps, uh, Whereas Kenya hasn't yet announced any jet fee, there is a likely potential that if anything transformative and really um, uh, that really looks at transition, which is the best way to do it, is not put into, into place. There is a likelihood that as politics evolve, there's somebody who will be convinced that, well, uh, use of coal is quite cheap. Uh, we can actually go that direction and also switching back to generation of electricity from uh, fossil fuels, uh, from uh, from oil is, is also viable, considering that we are now a producer of oil. So there's that scenario that we need to consider. And so, yeah, um, there's a potential for the country to go that direction, but uh, there need to be a lot of discussion to go into it. And looking at the aspect of just transition, there is a, a debate that is gaining traction in Kenya, especially on the e-cooking. And it's looking at displacing the use of charcoal and also the use of kerosene in cooking. But charcoal specifically is a sector that creates a lot of employment. And actually, um, <clears throat> I think it's the third most sector that creates employment to people and provide almost 50% of livelihoods uh, to those who are in the value chain. So if we were to displace the people that are reliant on charcoal, I think there is a lot that will need to be done beyond just promoting the e-cooking aspect of it. Over to you, Ben. Thank you. Food for thought, the opportunity cost of future emissions and, and new power stations as well as, as thinking about the biomass in the, in the cooking sector as kind of in scope. Um, so we're, we're coming on to a, a poll to get your views now. Um, so we've heard from our panelists, um, South Africa is predominantly focused on coal, but even then the scope for looking at energy, I think Tando mentioned across, across other sectors, maybe later down the line uh, in agriculture, et cetera, uh, Chitra has told us that um, there's a lack of looking at sort of uptake and use of energy, that, that that is something that she thinks could be in scope. And we've heard from uh, Nigeria that it's not all about coal, uh, very much uh, a diesel uh, issue, um, and that the needs for that differ dramatically, so they need to be uh, really understood better. So let's come on to the poll, Juliet. Are you able to put that up? Okay, so this is sort of your view around what the jet piece specifically, so not more broadly uh, the just energy transition, but the, the just energy transition partnerships uh, have uh, so far had predominant focus on justice for the workers in the energy sector uh, being displaced from coal. Do you think the scope of justice within JetPs should be? And tick one of your options here. So coal only, that that really that there's it needs to be a, a heavy focus on this, um, that that should be the priority, large scale removal of coal from the electricity generation mix. Do you think it should be expanded a bit? So any job negatively impacted by growing, uh, by greening the energy sector, so including the, the cooking biomass examples that have been um, discussed, or do you think something else? Uh, do you think it should be broader than that, possibly? Uh, this option here, we encourage you to um, uh, put your views in the chat uh, with the other options as well. Put your views in the chat as to why. Please vote now. We have some interesting comments coming in the chat. Here's our results. So coal only, which is the predominant focus now, only 9%. Most people are going for the second option that it should be broader within the energy sector. And then looking in the chat, 
energy is a need for all people, a just transition. It should be about justice for all workers, whether those losing work in any sector. Uh, we're moving uh, we're moving away from to ensuring rights for workers and communities who will be impacted by the development of critical mineral supply chains. So those kind of input sides, even to into renewables. Okay, that's interesting. Um, right. Right, so we're going to move on now to our second area, which is focusing, focusing on uh, implementation pathways. Um, Adenike, I'm going to come to you first. You've been working on operationalizing some of the cooking mentioned in, in Nigeria. Can you tell us more about the what and the how of, of these implementation pathways of, of justice within an energy transition? Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, so in terms of the processes that we are taking into consideration in operationalizing um, justice in the Nigeria energy transition, there's two main um, principles or pillars to this, um, which are stakeholder con consultation, policy alignment and awareness, and more importantly, um, data gathering, visualization, and analysis. So um, a key uh, principle for the Nigeria Energy Transition Office is effective coordination with um, stakeholders to align on policies and also foster awareness and create an appetite towards the energy um, transition. So we recognize the role that the diverse stakeholders have um, in shaping the trajectory of the energy transition. And so in um, clean cooking and as well as e-mobility and other pillars of the energy um, transition plan, we're organizing um, stakeholder sessions, which invite key players from government, private sector, um, civil society to discuss finance gaps, um, the opportunities in policy, um, data gaps, and also establish working groups to steer the implementation of the transition plan. And then with data gathering, um, the energy transition plan itself is a data-backed plan, and so data forms a key um a key part of understanding the needs of um the needs of people and so we take like some Kelly said a bottom up strategy um rooted in evidence based decision making so um gathering comprehensive data um and analyzing this data to be able to identify um identify needs and then quantify like market opportunities so um, that can be exemplified in the diesel displacement work and clean cooking, like you said, which are in the scope of the JetP. Um, so in, I'll start with diesel displacement very briefly and then talk more on clean cooking. So in diesel displacement, we are um, collaborating with government stakeholders, private um, stakeholders to collect primary and secondary um, data on Gensets usage to understand the um, usage patterns, the uh, the fuel reliance, and then be able to use that to design targeted programs to reduce the reliance of the reliance on diesel and petrol gensets in the state. And the idea is that the data from um, this project, which currently focuses on Lagos states, can be scaled up to other states um, so that it becomes a nationwide um, effort in reducing the reliance on diesel and petrol gensets. And then on clean cooking, we're um, addressing the um, needs. So we realize also we're working with the 176 million uh, Nigerians lacking access to clean cooking um, figure 
and we understand that this has um gender implications this health environmental implications but gender implications most especially as women and girls are disproportionately affected by this and so we see them as major stakeholders and um we we feel their importance is it's important to consult with them and understand their needs um in terms of clean cooking their cooking patterns preferences um in targeting solutions towards them and so some of the things that we're doing is organizing um community advocacy visits and not just using that as a means to educate them, but also to collect data. So for example, we recently um, conducted a visit to a small community in Abuja um, in Nigeria, where we discussed or we met with a group of about 215 women. And during this time as well, we used the opportunity to collect insights on fuel costs, um, the technologies they use, any specific feedback they had um, or preferences they had towards maybe charcoal, kerosene, um, other types of fuel with the idea of using those insights and future insights from other similar visits to create targeted um, data-driven solutions for them. Um, and then also we have um, the Lagos states leading um, in terms of uh, appetite on the state government level for the clean cooking um, transition. So like I said, with stakeholder coordination and policy alignment, we've been able to get um, some interest on the state level with different governments and legal state is leading with this. So we're currently designing a um, clean cooking strategy for legal states, which will start with primary data collection and a sector needs assessment. So we're able to identify communities that have um, like communities with like the highest urgency to transition away from um traditional cooking fuels. So yeah, this is the the approach that we're taking in. Great. Thank you so much. I was really interested in the the, the not only the consultations themselves, but uh, you combining it with a kind of a an advocacy awareness raising uh effort and your emphasis on the the kind of the data gaps and that bottom up process. Um, thank you very much. Please, please keep the questions coming. If you have uh, questions for Adonike or, or others, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, I'm going to come to you, Emmanuel. I think you've been working extensively on some of these uh, more community bottom up based processes in Kenya. Do you want to tell us a little bit more on, on what is needed for these kind of implementation pathways? Yeah, Ben, thank you. Um, I think in Kenya, the and sorry, policy... Emmanuel, we, we don't see you. I, I did uh, um, forget to mention that. I don't know if your camera is not working, but it would be great if you could switch on. Ah, oh, there we go. Hello. Uh, go let ahead, me try, please. but I have a very weak bandwidth. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I was saying uh, in Kenya, the policy and the regulatory environment allows two levels of planning at the national and also at the subnational level. And at a subnational level, we've been using an energy delivery models approach to support the county governments develop their plans. And in this approach, then we are putting the end user development needs at the core of the planning process. Um, of course, there are aspects of uh, it's very heavy on data. And so we do a lot of data collection. We do a, a lot of stakeholder engagement going down to the grassroots, um, really having conversations with community members to understand what are the development needs of, of these community members. And um, understanding that energy plays an enabling role, then when we are engaging with the community members, we really don't go in and say what energy 
do you need or do you have access to energy or not, but rather we are framing it as what are the development needs? What are the priority development needs for you? And so in doing that process, then you allow people really to give you a priority based on their own context. And in most of the cases, you realize that energy will not really be given a top priority development need. Uh, issues like income from improved agriculture, income from livestock, uh, access to clean water, access to better quality health services in remote areas are highly ranked as development needs for the communities. Um, but along the way, then you have to bring in aspects of, so you are not working in this alone as a community, but there are other stakeholders that you need to interact with. So we bring in the aspects of the CSO uh, participating in the process, the private sector, the government, both at the national level and the subnational level participating in the discussions. Um, one of the other key issues is that when you allow the community members to participate in ranking and prioritizing, there's this sense of ownership. They also aspect of that the community is not homogeneous. So within the community, there are different uh, social groupings. And we are heavy on applying the JC lens in trying to understand what are the actual development needs. Uh, in cases where, for example, the marginalized uh, groups like uh, people living with HIV and AIDS, depending on the context, the widows, depending on their context, have not participated in the initial meetings, then you, fi you find a way in which you have groups, uh, uh, focus group discussion with them, just also for them to have an opportunity to give you their uh, the priority development needs come up with what are the barriers based on their context that are making this not these needs not being met. Also come up with what best solutions perhaps will, wa will work for, for them based on their own context. And uh, along the way, you realize that the kind of uh, development needs, the kind of gaps that are identified, the kind of solutions that come up from the different stakeholders, uh, starting down at the community level, help a lot in shaping what kind of a plan will go out that will feed into the national energy planning process. And the beauty with the, with the, the legal framework in Kenya is that the national government will not develop an energy plan beyond what has come from the county government or from the county level. So then using a bottom-up approach helps to shape how the country, how Kenya as a country will then be transitioning, bearing in mind that everybody has been involved in determining how the energy will play uh, an enabling role in the different development needs they prioritize. How about Thank you, you very much. So a very structured approach to really gathering that data, uh, understanding yeah. the needs and feeding it up. Um, Chitra, yes. I'll come to you for the Indonesia perspective and also throw in a question that we have <coughs> from uh, Claire. Um, she's asking that you've touched on some of the limitations of the JETPs, but um, what are some of the external challenges of utilizing these instruments in Indonesia? Um, may maybe you can speak to that with respect to the implementation. All right, so I guess to build upon what I have just shared um, on how energy delivery model approach could be utilized effectively in answering the justice part of providing energy access. Um, to us, understanding the complexity of providing reliable, sustainable energy access in Indonesia is very important because we are a very massive country. We have more than 17,000 islands um, with, with a very different um, development stage in a way. So we can talk about urban versus rural, national versus subnational. And I guess understand the nuance and complexity of the issue is very important because then justice will have to take into account what's what's actually happening um, in different areas, in different community. And I, I observed that the two um, approach, which is assessment and intervention, could could be beneficial in terms of providing um, um, an effective and optimum policy 
to answer the energy access challenges. So we need to carefully assess what's the needs of the people of the community. And it's usually not only energy for basic activities, but also to increase their welfare, to increase their access to education, health, etc. So it will it will definitely provide um, a sound uh, basis on how to intervene and uh, the next step, the intervention. Um, we talk about different sets of authority in Indonesia. We talk on um, the, the government level level of authority in the national and subnational, they are very different. Um, and especially for the development priorities, uh, each um, subnational uh, government has their own sets of agenda. And it is quite important to do policy um, advocacy targeted at different sets of the priority. So there is no a simple recipe uh, to promote uh, justice in energy access and bottom-up energy access approach from our um, experience um, with energy delivery model and also just transition program in Indonesia. We need to carefully maintain first the, the, the same perspective and understanding between different stakeholders in the same region or same stakeholders in different regions. And then we have to give a, a sound assessment on what to proceed next with providing energy access and how to promote justice in the development um, of, of energy access. It means consultation, involvement, even public awareness, um, just to give uh, um, a different uh, perspective on how people see energy access and justice. And it requires a lot of time. So we cannot finish um, assessment or the intervention in such short amount of time. And I guess this is a call for the government and important stakeholders just to take the time to carefully maintain the assessment and intervention. And I guess to answer the question on JetP, if we talk about uh, just energy transition, it will definitely be beyond the JETP program that we have for now. And we also talk about different type of transition because we have coal provinces. We also have known coal provinces. We have provinces with different energy access. We have provinces with uh, very good energy access, but very low development uh, problems. So we need to understand that the complexity of the situation is there and that we need time. And then we need uh, two important Important steps to ensure that um, it comes to fruition. A really good assessment and a sound um, intervention in terms of policy and also probably investment. Thank you very much, Tita. So maybe a message there that the, the kind of the impetus of JetPs around things like uh, the COP process is too quick to have a really meaningful bottom-up uh, participation and engagement on what justice looks like within the energy transition. Thank you. Tando, let me come to you um, and, and move a little bit to if you if you can talk uh, to the implementation, but also I think you mentioned earlier on the policy and finance. Maybe you can speak to a little bit of what's needed within the policy uh, uh, and the types of finance that, that might be required to realize what's being uh, proposed in South Africa. Okay. Um, thanks, Ben. So, so let's talk policy first, and then we'll talk finance uh, next. Um, on the policy front, um, the first one that was needed or is needed, uh, we recognize the need for a climate change bill in this country, right, in South Africa. And in the climate bill, it speaks to the um, establishment of what's called the Presidential Climate Commission, which is the body that's coordinating um, South Africa's just transition. Now, the, the bill itself is still a bill, um, although we're expecting it to become uh, an actual act uh, early next year. Uh, and in so doing, it will make the Presidential Climate Commission um, a constituted body. What this means is that <clears throat> outside of its um, mandate to then operate and, and coordinate the just transition in the country, it will also have the necessary authority to then put in place new policy proposals um, that, that, that speak to specific changes that would need to happen relative to delivering on some of the justice uh, elements, some of the equity elements, and even the energy elements. So an example of this, for example, is um, we've got the Electricity Regulations Act bill at the moment, which speaks to the shift from the minister being the exclusive uh, authority to determine which energy um, sources will be used and the capacity thereof, and shifting that away to um, an independent system operator which will then manage the entire system, including 
the different generation options, including the, 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 the different distributors as well. Um, largely, our current policy does not make uh, provision for private um, players to feed electricity direct to consumers. At this stage, the policy still speaks to uh, electricity being from the state entity, which is ESCOM at this moment. So IPPs uh, take, well, the off-taker is ESCOM, which is the national utility. So IPP generates, the national utility takes and distributes to municipalities and direct to some consumers. The system, um, in part driven by the, 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 the PCC process, will say there will be multiple generation sources that look at multiple uh, generation options. From those options, it will go to an independent system operator, which will then determine what is the quantities needed um, relative to the respective um, generation options, and then who's the best person to then distribute that, whether that's going to be a private uh, company, that is going to be the municipality, or that might be ESCOM, depending on where that location is. So that's essentially where things are. How it relates to then some of these justice components is, again, going back to that issue of the free basic electricity, right? That is a, a policy that exists, but the allocations haven't yet changed. One of the things that needs to change, particularly to address the justice components and the equity components is those allocations, and then the access to, uh, for people to then have some of that electricity and who will pay for it. Uh, one of the challenges is where the money is going to come from. And I think that's a, it's just a debate for, for, for many different spaces. Uh, that's happening at a national level. When we come down to a uh, subnational and local government level, it's only, uh, at least in our country, it's only subnational governments that have got energy departments. So even though um, at the moment we've got a large decentralized energy system, we need to move it to a decentralized energy system. But local government particularly does not have, let's call it the rights, uh, according to present policy, to be able to distribute directly, uh, to generate their own electricity and distribute it directly to their consumers, which in our context would help, right? Because if, if you look at the geography of South Africa, 80% of our coal fleet is sitting in the northern part of the country. The large transmission lines mean that it's very expensive to, to, to transport that electricity down to the Western Cape or to Cape Town, for example. So the ability to be able to generate the electricity at source is something that is really being pushed at a, from a policy perspective as well. This is why the independent system operator is becoming necessary. But also, there, there, there needs to be a space where communities now can contact directly the local government, local municipalities to be able to get better access to electricity. We've got what we call the indigent policy, which makes this allocation, but it in itself is insufficient because there are many people who qualify for this on paper, but don't actually have direct access to it and therefore cannot reap the benefits of cheaper electricity as a result of this policy. So this is something that's also been looked at from a local government level that's been pushed at a, at a, at a mayoral level and um, thanks, legislative Thanks, level. Tando. Thanks. Yeah. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, but we're in the interest of time. Uh, it, I mean, again, you're, you're talking about much more localized processes and the, and the requirement for that. Um, I'm going to come, uh, we, we only have five minutes left. I'm going to come quickly for for uh, one or two minutes with uh, Som Kele. Um, and also to sort of on the finance policy question, throw in some of these questions that are coming in the chat. So there's a question around um, who really, if we're talking about kind of energy access and some of these constituents that might be currently missed out of the JET P's, um, who who is who are, who is actually pushing that at the national level? Is it is it government? Is it CSOs? Is it kind of private sector? Um, where where is that demand coming from? Uh, Some Kelly, over to you. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Okay, um, so I think it's a, I think it's a combination of responsibilities. Obviously, uh, the government's major role is protection of life and property. And part of that protection of life and property involves providing energy access. Uh, so in the Nigeria context, we have two key goals uh, as relates to energy uh, our energy transition. That's universal access by 2030 and uh, reaching at zero by 2060. And that will involve all stakeholders participating in, in, that, in understanding that process. So at the moment, I think about 96 million uh, Nigerians lack access to great electricity. So that then gives you the context of how do you do uh, some off-grid solutions? How do you get some of those solutions to be on-grid? Well, I want to quickly touch on the financing. The financing bit of the energy transition is extremely important for, 
for the justice piece that we've spoken about all day. If $10 billion is promised and only 3% of that is grant, I'm not really sure that that is a justice play because at the end of the day, there are already existing debt issues as a result of COVID, prior to COVID, as countries are trying to develop, uh, de um, develop in the global south. So it's very important that when, we're, when, when the International Partner Group or G Fans is making these pledges, they consider. So in Nigeria, for instance, it's very difficult when you're looking at clean solutions to get return on investments of 30, 40 percent or 15 percent, as the case may be. So when you provide concessional loans to drive clean cooking, uh, the clean cooking drive, you're putting a huge burden on whatever country that is. So in even in the coal context, I know they're thinking about it in terms of CAPEX funding and trying to upscale. But I think that that consideration, uh, we should really be focusing on how we finance because for 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 Africa in in, in general, we we contribute a very minimal amount, but we're disproportionately affected by climate change activities. So I think that the financing, when considering justice, should reflect those disparities. Absolutely. Thank you very much. That's an important last point. Well, thank you very much to all our panelists. Let me try to sum up um, as much as I can. Uh, I think what's come across here is that the JEPs themselves need to broaden, at least with, with, to, to encompass the, spoke, uh, the scope of uh, the, the wider uh, energy sector. Um, this can include jobs that are, are being impacted even in the uh, mining of, of renewables uh, the, or the uh, rare metals that are used for that. I think there's also appetite for um, uh, use of energy. So outside of the energy sector, what's the justice within that as part of an energy transition? And the real need across that to be having bottom-up participatory processes to really understand and, and distinguish between the different needs. Otherwise, uh, the, the solutions are not gonna be delivered uh, and the justice is, is not going to be, to be met. So perhaps that kind of initial coal jobs push is not um, broad enough. We certainly need more, uh, concessional finance to some killer to your last point uh, and more grant-based finance to really achieve some of the justice. There's a question then within uh, jet peas versus what the wider energy transition of the roles of other stakeholders of national governments uh, in delivering, um, but putting that as part of the mix and uh, bringing some of these discussions uh, into the debates that are gonna be happening at COP28. So thank you very much all again, uh, and we'll continue the discussion uh, offline. Thanks, everyone. It's really great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.